Okay, everybody, um, welcome back. As we move into our roundtable discussion now. As you know, this event is titled The Process of Content on a Temporality in Contemporary Art. And the title is really intended to reflect Opperman's interest in processes of perception and cognition. Her awareness that thought is not so, uh, so much about the what as about the how, or rather that those two things are intimately related. Thinking and being are temporal practices, processes, a sequence of encounters and events, feedback loops, memories, and reflections. In this spirit of reflection and feedback, we wanted to take the exhibition as a starting point to share ideas and thoughts on the histories, politics, and social reverberations of the art practices of Opperman and her time, the 70s and 80s, and to explore their resonance in our own time, in our own historical moment. We've already had a very stimulating series of readings, and as I mentioned at the outset, we're lucky enough to have an extremely eminent panel here for the roundtable this afternoon. Um, I'll introduce them in turn. First of all, at the far end there, we have Professor Dr. Martin Warnke, who's based at Lausanne University in um, Germany at the Institute of Culture and the Aesthetics of Digital Media, where he's Professor of Digital Media and Information Culture. He's the author of numerous books and articles, including works such as Hypercult, History, Theory and Context of Digital Media, and Theories of the Internet. He's also written numerous pieces on Opperman's work, along with his colleague, Carmen Wedemeyer, who unfortunately couldn't be here today due to illness. Together, they created the digital archive of her ensembles that you'll have seen downstairs in this exhibition, which really not only documents um, Opperman's work, but responds to her method in terms of enabling um, access and cross-referencing of uh, the different pieces in her ensembles. Martin and Carmen have published a number of articles um, on Opperman's work, including one in Leonardo called Documenting Artistic Networks, and Opperman's ensembles are complex networks, and I believe Martin will say a bit about that today. I should point out that the um, archive, the digital archive um, that Martin and Carmen have created was initiated by Anna Opperman, um, and she was involved with that for the first couple of years um, of its production. And Martin says that he... Um, has learned almost everything he, he knows about documenting complex artworks digitally through working with Anna Opperman's work because it was such an important and significant test case because it's so complex. Our second panelist is Toby Meyer. Toby is a German freelance curator and art critic based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. He was a curator at the Frankfurter Kunstverein from 2006 to 2008 at Ludlow 38 New York from 2008 to 2011, and he was involved in 2011 and 2012 with the 30th Sao Paulo Biennale. He's curated many diverse international exhibitions. In 2000 and alone, he was responsible for an exhibition in Paris, The Second Sex, A Visual Footnote. He was also responsible for Was ist Kunst, Mirrors of Production, which brought together work by Brazilian and European artists, and a couple of exhibitions of Brazilian artists um, Marcelo Sipis and Andre Brandano. I'm probably murdering those names, I'm sorry. <laughs> he regularly publishes some, and lectures on art in venues around the world, and he's currently developing an international residency program for the Goethe Institute, um, which will be in El Salvador, Dabaya. He also writes um, and has uh, recently co edited OEI 60 to 61 Extra Dis Disciplinary Spaces and De, -disciplin De Disciplinizing Moments. Um, in and out of the 30th Biennale de uh, Sao, Sao Paulo in 2013, and OEI 66 Poma Process uh, 2014, as well as the fourth edition of the Brazilian online magazine Periodico Permanente. Um, Anna Opperman was part of the uh, Biennale in Sao Paulo, so um, Toby has curated Anna's work as well. Guy Brett, our third panelist here, is an art critic and curator based in London. He has a very distinguished um, CV. He worked as an art critic for The Times from uh, 1964 to 1974 and was a founding member of Signals Gallery, which held a series of exhibitions between 1964 and 66, showing the works of artists such as Jesus Rafael Soto, Sergio Carmago, Ligia Clark, and Ilio Otisica. He later played a fundamental role in facilitating Otisica's major London exhibition, The Whitechapel Experiment, at the Whitechapel Gallery in 1969. 
And he's since curated a number of influential exhibitions, including, among many others, um, a 2002 exhibition of the work of Boris Gerritz. And you may remember that he was here um, a couple of years ago in converse, a conversation event for the Boris Gerritz um, exhibition that was held at the Cooper Gallery. He most recently curated the exhibition The Enclosed Openness, Box and Book in Brazilian Art at the Pinacoteca in Sao Paulo, Brazil in 2013. And he's also the author of uh, many articles and books, most recently Abstract Vaudeville, the work of Rose English from 2014. In fact, that's just coming out at present. And he's held a number of academic posts. Um, and he's currently a visiting professor at the University of Arts in London. Like Guy, our fourth panelist, Lydia Morris, has been a great supporter of the Cooper Gallery. And I'm sure many of you will remember her 2013 exhibition, Dear Linda, which explored her hugely significant uh, contribution to contemporary art. Linda is professor in curation and curator at the Norwich Gallery at NUA and um, founder of the renowned East International Contemporary Art Programme. Over the last 30 years, East International has included work with Peter Doig, Neil Rausch, Jeff Wall, Lawrence Weiner, Richard Long, Marion Goodman, Peter Kennard, Gustav Metzger and Conrad Fischer. She previously worked at the IS, uh, ICA on exhibitions including When Attitudes Become Form, which is a seminal exhibition, of course, and Ed Keenholt's Ten Tableau. And she worked with Richard Hamilton on his retrospective at the Guggenheim. Linda Morris has create, curated significant exhibitions in major venues internationally, including the first minimal, exhibition of minimal art in the UK, Strata, in 1973 at the RCA, and more recently, documenting Kader 1972 to 78, which traveled from modern art Oxford to Musée Ostend, Artist Space New York, and will travel to Romania in 2015. And also Genuine Conceptualism, Writings of Linda Morris since 1970, which was accompanied by a publication and a conference this year. Morris frequently contributes to uh, international journals, art journals, and edits publications, including Unconcealed, the International Network of Conceptual Artists, 1967 to 77, uh, Dealers, Exhibitions and Public Collections in 2009, and Conception, Conceptual Documents, 1968 to 1972, with Catherine Mosley in 2000, the year 2000. She has an article coming out this December in uh, Text zur Kunst, which is a German um, journal, an article on Conrad Fischer and art dealing, and she's going to speak a little bit about uh, that, that research today as well. Like Martin and Guy, Linda too has contributed to the Cooper Gallery publishing program, and Sophia's asked me to draw your attention to the fact that um, the Cooper Gallery publications are available for purchase at a special rate today, so uh, you can get your hands on their writing and they may even sign them for you if you're very lucky. Okay. So a quick word about today's format. Sophia and I sent a number of questions around to our speakers in advance and asked them to prepare a five minute presentation. So they're going to do that um, and they're going to speak in order and um, we'll go through all of the presentations. And then we'll have about half an hour of discussion just amongst the panel. I'm going to invite them to respond to each other's um, ideas. And then we'll open the discussion up to the floor um, for the last 40 minutes to half an hour. We have to finish very promptly because we must get out of the gallery um, promptly at half past four, so I will be quite strict on the timing. Um, so please do have your questions ready. Don't hold off. Um, get in there early. Um, so we'll start with Martin. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. So thank you very much for the invitation. Also, on behalf of Carmen, it was very sad not to be here. So I have to do her job uh, as well. I'm sure I couldn't do it as well as her, as she would have done, but I try at least. And um, so I show you the first image. Uh, I would like to give a, you a short introduction to our hypermedial picture text archive we did on some of Anna Oppermann's ensembles. I do so on the Goethe Ensemble, on which you can have a closer look yourselves downstairs in the gallery rooms where there is put up a system. And if you like, you could follow the link from the uh, web page of this event. There is a link um, pointing to the 
system I'm showing you in a minute, so you could spend as much time as you like uh, where, wherever you have internet to have a, have a look yourself. The question is how can one archive a highly complex piece of art consisting of hundreds or thousands of elements like photos, drawings, text copies, sketches, newspaper clippings, handwritten texts, and so on, as you can see here with Cotoniasta horizontalis. One way to do so could be something we would call the classic one, uh, like normal databases do, uh, that could perhaps look what I've projected here. And in fact, these are all the 1,700 elements of the Goethe ensemble, uh, that you could see in our system. But to arrange the material in such an ordered way is not equivalent to Anna Oppermann's method of creating her ensembles. And this looks more what I'm showing you now. They look in contrast to the strict arrangement we have seen before on the first glance very chaotic, confusing and structureless. But indeed they are not, not at all. What you see here, for instance, is a photo canvas showing a total view of the first public installation of the Goethe Ensemble that was in Frankfurt, 1982. The artist was invited by a broadcasting company to do a work on Goethe because of his 150th uh, anniversary of death. The Oppermann Ensembles have an inherent structure. It is a hierarchical one. Ensemble elements are depicted over and over again in different ways, techniques, pers perspectives, and scales. And you could train your eye yourself by going to the ensemble and have a look what elements are depicted on what other elements over and over again. Starting from an initial object, she arranged this together with others over and over again. The newly created pictures are then aside to the older ones and depicted in the next one together with them. Uh, Carmen got the material uh, by Anna Oppermann unordered, stored in ordinary shoe boxes and plastic bags. So to get a rough overview, she first grouped the objects by the materials, that is, are there drawings, photos, texts, or whatever, and by size. Size was important for the scanner. Gave she gave them uh, an, an ID and measured them. So the basic metadata was, were added um, at the very first place. Next, every piece was scanned with, a, uh, with a, just an ordinary scanner, flatbed scanner with 300 dots per inch, because in 1996, hard disk space was still precious, uh, and, and so, so we had to reduce ourselves to uh, 300 dpi. And then she loaded the images into what we call the hyperimage editor for interlinking. In our method of archiving the ensembles, this structure of continuous depiction is used as the main order of things. This is the structure. But we did it in the opposite way Anna Oppermann did. Starting from the end, from a view of the whole ensemble, we are going deeper and deeper into it till we reach Anna Oppermann's starting elements. That means to elements without any further reference on them. So I can show you this with this photo canvas uh, that consists of depictions of other photo canvases like those or of small objects here inside or of text blocks like those. Maybe you can already see that this photo con canvas lying at the floor depicts the situation, situation around here. But anyway, I go to some, to some photo, uh, other photo canvas like this one, and I could uh, go deeper inside. For instance, I could go here. I could go back. I could choose that one. I could choose that one. This is a drawing, which is not the last. It still refers, uh, it still re uh, refers to something else. Let's see what we have there. It is a drawing of this uh, cutout photo. And there are annotations and metadata. And you can see that the, this is a photo of Eckermann, the assistant to Goethe. Uh, uh, 
Carmen uh, scanned also uh, the other pieces, like the negative outer part of it. We go back. And uh, since she saw with her own eyes all the references ending at some initial uh, elementary object, the computer could list it up and tell us where are the places where there are references to this object. And this is done by the uh, operation to navigation and all backtracking. That means uh, in all of these objects there, there are, um, there are references to, to this cutout photo. For instance, say, where did we start? Or we could take just another one. Let's take that one. And there you have highlighted the, the photo that is already in here. To see what the whole situation is, you choose whole picture and you see that it was back in here. So you could try to find out, the, say, the context of every piece, since she put it, by depicting it, she put it in, in new contexts all the time. So it was very important to, for her to, um, uh, for, for Carmen doing the system, to uh, group stuff uh, into uh, into um, material types, for instance, into printed text, which are in this uh, in this uh, situation most of the times uh, text by Goethe. So let's see what we can find here. For instance, we we take that one. There is a transcription, and if she found it, she also provided for an English translation. So there is the source of the text. There you have the original German text. And there you have the, the English translation. <coughs> so you could spend hours and hours with that. And I would like to, uh, uh, to uh, talk you into it. You could do it downstairs, or you could do it by just following the link, which that is on the, uh, on the uh, website of this exhibition. And since I think I've already eaten up the 10 minutes, or at least nine minutes, uh, I will leave you with a system to yourself. Have a try downstairs and have a try on the internet. And uh, th that was Carmen's presentation. And now, now I will have mine, if you allow. <laughs> This time, the, the time when Anna Oppermann created her ensembles were the early years of the emerging internet. Her first ensembles date from the late 60s, her last from 1991. You know that the privately used internet started at the end of the 80s. The web was invented during a typical three-year three project at CERN between 1989 and 1992 letting internet use surge immediately. The technological avant-garde culture Anna Oppermann was surrounded with was the one of mailbox systems powered by telephone modems that produces, produced that typical snarling sing-song and rattling during transmission of the data. Is there still anybody who knows that sound? The, the elder ones know that. <laughs> Text could be exchanged first emails, discussions flourished on the so-called list servers. It was the idea of the hypertext, which by the definition of Ted Nelson meant non-sequential writing, that excited theorists and practitioners likewise. The technical solution for text was brought about by the World Wide Web that still is growing around the world. Anna Oppermann thus was really at the forefront of the avant-garde, if one could say so. She found an, an artistic expression for her situation that was the one of postmodern mode of existence. No single perspective, no firmly grounded position, but competing points of view, incompatible and contradicting truths, multiply reflected images, mirrors all around, 
floods of images of texts, all interconnected and related. To have found an expression for this overwhelming complexity may be the reason why Oppermann's works are being rediscovered right now. What she expressed artistically is simply the situation of all of us for the digital immigrants or the digital natives alike. It is thus for good reasons that the formal structure of Anna Oppermann's works resemble the one of the internet itself. You have seen by the presentation I gave instead of Carmen Wedemeyer that our techniques notes and stores all of the references the artist had put into her ensemble. So we know explicitly the referential structure of her work up to a quantitative level of precision that we now, that we now can state, yes, Oppermann's works show a type of complexity that is similar to the one of the internet itself. Mathematics has found a notion, did a definition that is called complex network, for which there are numerical requirements and structural criteria. Oppermann's ensembles meet these criteria, and so now we know why they have their wonderful properties. They could have grown and grew without recognizable limits. They are robust against being taken apart and reassembled again. They have no center that governs everything, but only a multitude of hubs. And this for me being the most characteristic feature, they are without a typical scale. They assemble, for instance, highly linked objects with poorly linked ones, without any Gauss curve median in the middle. There are tiny little snippets and huge canvases protruding objects and hidden notes. Let me put it that way. No median is the message. There is an absence of mediated normality and the rule of an aporetic condition that Oppermann's ensembles express. The aesthetics is a one of sudden insight. There is neither any more a vanishing point nor is there the place for the privileged observer. The sublime and the banal are side by side, as explicitly stated by the artist within the Goethe Ensemble, or talking about artistic means, there is the coexistence and the paradoxical reign of art and design, for instance, in Cotoniasta Horizontalis, that she herself experienced as professor in Wuppertal. The paradoxical, as the most characteristic of her work, is also the main attribute of our internet culture. All this is very well known to the citizens of the internet. The starkest contrasts, the absence of mean and middle, the rule of the aporetic. Anna Oppermann has seen this while others still believed in authority and measure and she struggled with it by producing her art as contemporary uh, of a technical avant-garde development that is like no other a landmark of our times of unrest and uncertainty. She did it in a highly susceptible manner, taking on and contributing to the spirit of the 60s to the 80s, when all certainty and certitude vanished into the complexity of rhizomatic thinking, and mille plateau. This is no comfortable place to be, but it is the place we inhabit all together. Thank you very much. Okay, um, yeah, uh, thank you very much. Uh, very much for the invitation to speak here today, and thank you. Um, for coming here to hear us. Um, it's a, a great honor for me to be here on a panel with such a set of distinguished speakers. And um, I must say, I also enjoyed very much um, the reading or the writing um, that was presented before. Um, some of it was um, very inspiring and also tying in with my own thoughts about 
um, this exhibition and about you know contemporary art and um, visual art production at the moment. So when Sophia invited me to speak here as part of the symposium, she mentioned that ideas of process and the practice of thinking and inhabiting, constructing a work through multiple moments of encounter as well as Deleuze's thinking around knowledge and learning were important to her in relation to Oppermann's work. And in the booklet accompanying this exhibition, um, an essay entitled What is an Ensemble has been reprinted written by Oppermann. It had first been published in the German journal Kunstforum International for 1978 under the rubric Analysis in an, effort, in an effort to attain a general overview. Oppermann writes that it must be stressed that polyphonic expansion alternates with summary. Time plays a key part, especially in the necessary achievement of distances and therefore the production and modification of many ensembles extends over years, theoretically, is never completed. So ideas like um, constellations, or what Martin was just um, showing also, was very reminiscent, and we were talking about this earlier, like the Warburgian atlas, and the idea of selection to create meaning, um, the abundance of images in internet communication or Instagram, Facebook, Wikipedia come to mind when looking at and thinking about many of Oppermann's ensembles nowadays. I have here clipped a couple of images from artists' Instagram profiles. Francis Stark, uh, an artist based in Los Angeles, and Bianca Abad, an uh, artist based in Sao Paulo. And we can set these in an analogy to the selfies that Oppermann produced between 65 and 75. Of course, these selected images from Stark and Abad's Instagram profiles come in a much more direct fashion to us. And when thinking more about these um, productions, um, recently I came across this uh, part of um, a text by Baudria in The Ecstasy of Communication, and many of you probably know this, and um, I found it was very timely, um, although written a long time ago. The Shizo, and I quote, the Shizo is bereft of every scene, open to everything in spite of himself, living in the greatest confusion. He is himself obscene, the obscene prey of the world's obscenity. What characterizes him is less the loss of the real, the light years of estrangement from the real, the pathos of distance and radical separation, as is commonly said, but very much to the contrary, the absolute proximity, the total instantaneity of things, the feeling of no defense, no retreat. It is the end of interiority and intimacy the overexposure and transparency of the world which traverses him without obstacle. He can no longer produce the limits of his own being, can no longer play nor stage himself, can no longer produce himself as mirror. He is now only a pure screen, a switching center for all the networks of influence. Of course, it's different now than back then when Oppermann was active. These images on social media confront us on our small screens, whereas Oppermann's selections are presented in a more opaque mediation. And perhaps what Martin is doing is also um, motivated by sort of um, loosening up this opaqueness and bringing us closer to some of the sources that are in these ensembles. Like we view them from a distance, right? We can't really step into these altars. We can't get close to many of these um, text selections. Now, Elke Bippos has commented on Oppermann's work that unlike ethnologists, however, Oppermann refrains from translating her recorded observations, events of experiences into comprehensible data derived from special material which means that she dispenses with the process of creating a linear kind of meaning. In contrast to that, the speaker before me here, Martin, noted that complexity leads to a need to select, since not all elements can be joined, 
decisions have to be made about which relationships should actually be realized. This decision was up to the artist who thus created meaning and information. So I think there seems to be a point here about assemblage and selection to create meaning in addition to what Sophia has termed process, knowledge and learning, multiple moments of encounter. Two other artists, male figures, come to mind when thinking about the ensembles and their open-endedness, the ensembles and the practices of Oppermann. These are the altars of Thomas Hirschhorn, of course, one of which was also um, dedicated to Deleuze and Bataille, and you probably know them. And the work of another much, much less known figure from Brazil, Vladimir Diaz Pino, born in 1927 in Cuayaba in Brazil. Diaz Pino is one of the protagonists of Poema Processo, a Brazilian avant-garde movement launched at the same time on December 11, 1967 in Rio de Janeiro and Natal. Due to the pressure from the military dictatorship, the movement was brought to a halt in 1972. Poema Processo was a counter-movement to the concrete poets of the De Campos brothers and Decio Pignatari from Sao Paulo. It was a much more visual, colorful, and three-dimensional visual poetry. A poetry that allowed for many different versions and that encouraged viewer interaction with the printed object. If selections were realized by Oppermann for the production of her open-ended ensembles, they have and have not always materialized in Vladimir Diaz Pino's visual encyclopedia. You can see this here. And I imagine, I don't know, but I imagine that perhaps Anna's uh, archive at some point didn't look very different in terms of how she stored her work. This work here is an encyclopedia that encompasses 1,001 titles corresponding to 1,100, no, 1,001 volumes. Everything is interconnected, so it's difficult to create an order. The de definitions of the titles in this visual encyclopedia are classified like in a dictionary where you have an alphabetic order. We can see them here in the slides or, or not, um, but you could see like words like events, the sacred, the city. In his visual encyclopedia, Vladimir Diaz Pino is among other things treating the origin of writing and of images. And he has talked about the prehistory of the visual. It is interesting to think more about this concept and how it is related to the question of alphabetization, to the idea of universal languages and the significance of forms in visual historiography. Similar to Oppermann's ensembles, one must think about the encyclopedic project as a whole, about the relation between the archive and the published parts of the encyclopedia, how these work were produced, printed, or distributed. So he set out basically to um, denominate 1001 keywords and then kept clipping from uh, books, magazines, all sorts of sources, uh, images and texts and um, archive them in these folders. Diaz Pino says that what inaugurates Occidental culture is the separation between writing and image. He considers that we have an alphabetical literacy but no visual literacy. In his encyclopedia, Diaz Pino tried to avoid making cultural references as these would weaken the strength of the image. When he started to study visuality, he discovered that between the 9th and the 13th century, there is a space that is not properly registered in the history of visuality in Brazil. You see images from the 9th century and then from the 13th century, and between them there is like a huge gap. This troubled him, and he needed to find out more about it. He said that he wanted to show how a visual alphabetization developed. For example, how did different generations and epochs portray Adam and Eve? And the development of visuality can't be explained through discourse. Diaz Pino says that he still hasn't found a satisfying explanation 
to the aforementioned gap, but it's probably not a coincidence if the 10th, the 11th, and the 12th centuries are also the era of the Crusaders, an era of invasion and theft of the culture of the other. So with this vast number of folders with materials for the visual encyclopedia, is he planning to exhibit this archive, and if so, how? From Diaz Pino's point of view, the visual encyclopedia is, from the very beginning, a utopia, a work that can't be completed a bit similar to Oppermann's ensemble, which are now somehow closed in themselves, but of which she also saw, thought of as open-ended projects. So one can't expect any conclusion from this project. It will always grow, just like nature and time. It's like adding to the ensembles. He will always be able to add to the sections such as events, the sacred, the city. The encyclopedia in its published form would depend on the versions yeah, that we have also seen in the books that he will have the possibility to make. So Vladimir Diaz Pino keeps on collecting for and working on the encyclopedia, preparing versions of it. If he could, he would probably create 1,001 ensembles, yet his act of collecting, similar to Oppermann, keeps him active at high age, could we call it a therapeutic idea. Now, how does this relate to a reality of today, the images we saw at the beginning of my talk, so-called post-internet art and the image production on the internet that uses servers for archiving and the design, design frameworks of software, cell phone cameras, etc., as modes of production, where selection is made by intuition and folders created via hashtags? where we confront a constant broadcast of identity as a recognizable and unique brand. How, we can, how can we compare, if at all, Oppermann's and Hirschhorn's ensembles and altars that feature manifold objects, sculptures, paintings, drawings, newspaper clippings, etc., or Diaz Pino's pre-Wikipedia visual encyclopedia and the work of young artists today? What and where are the repercussions? This is to say that what the artist once did by creating distinct projects has been swapped for a more personality-based form of artistic commodification, using tagged images and text to highlight oneself through humor, intellectualism, or camaraderie in social networks. But can we feel the same intensity, the same agency in a digital image seen on our screen? Isn't there a difference between encountering an altar by Hirschhorn in a subterranean passage by accident versus a JPEG in the profile somebody or profile of somebody we have been following for a while. I suggest there is, and yet I believe that the physical manifestation of these artistic beliefs and searches for truth can now go hand in hand with the digital realm. But if we don't want to turn into avatars, if we want to feel these carnal elements, as Oppermann has described them in her ensemble Mr. S since 1969, love, sex, eroticism, devil, hell, sky, sin, penance, confession, itches, chaos, crucifix, crucifixion, cross, erection, phallus, horse, Bettauflegung, double standards, gap in one's teeth, we still need material materializations or we end up with an art without artists. Thank you. I'd like to, uh, <coughs> I'd like to thank uh, Sophia and Lisa for inviting me to speak here. Um, I very much admire the policy here of um, drawing attention to artists of the first rank who have never really been, work has never really been shown to people in, in the UK. This is a very valuable, uh, with such a tight homogeneity between many museums across the world, this is a, a very important um, activity, I think, I feel very strongly. I didn't know anything about Oppermann work 
uh, when I got the invitation card. I'd never heard her name, I'd never seen the work. Um, I was invited to speak. I didn't really know um, if I could say anything valuable about work I didn't know. Um, but I was struck even uh, in photographs by uh, the audacity, really, I think, of uh, the, the way she presented her thoughts and feelings. Um, uh, spreading right outside the uh, limits and of the conceptual limits of uh, an exhibit and an exhibition. So, uh, initially, I thought um, that the theme of corners, work in corners, could be uh, investigated. Um, I'd had some, I'd, I'd known for a long time about. Uh, Tatlin's uh, corner reliefs, corner counter reliefs, um, in R Russia in, in the 1915-16, and these works had had really come about after Tatlin visited Picasso in Paris, and and was um, enormously admiring of Takis's work and but in a, in a way uh, because this is has a feeling of a cubist construction but it's um, uh, in, deployed in the corner and again you see the uh, work mounted in the corner in Malevich's exhibition um, which was called the, Far the last futurist uh, exhibition in Russia in Moscow um, and I'd seen this image before and wondered again about the, the, the meaning of hanging uh, a work across a corner. It's quite a nice description of, 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 the, of Tatlin's work. Which I'd just like to, uh, to, to read the paragraph. by a, 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 an art historian who, whose work I didn't know, called Jan Kasper Bolt. And he as, as goes as follows. Uh, the constructions uh, simulate a tension-filled state of suspension. Uh, there is no clear support point. In Tatlin's corner counter-reliefs, a sort of rigging serves as a replacement for the plinth of statues from earlier times. The compositional principle of these works contains a clear anti-structural component, an orchestrated playing with gravity and its invalidation. Uh, Tatlin's corner counter-reliefs are about distance, the space of the in-between, a space more energized uh, adversary than flattering atmosphere that is both real and part of the imagination. Some images appear to, to have been lost, actually, in, 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 into cyberspace. And, um, I was looking at them earlier, but um, they seem to have disappeared. But never mind, we'll carry on with the verbal text. When I actually came to Dundee and saw the work in, its, in, in reality, um, I realized that it was uh, a far more uh, complex creation than I imagined. Um, I'd seen it perhaps in, in the tradition of collage, uh, a very uh, important f facet of 20th century art. Um, and it, I think it can be seen as, as giant collages, but uh, they go beyond the the, the way that that uh, concept has been used, the forms of co that are collaged and the references between them, are, as 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 every, everyone knows, are extremely complex. And I realised that as this, as an ordinary spectator coming into the room, 
to look at the exhibition, that uh, there were parts of the work which were, which were inaccessible uh, to me, to the spectator. Um, they, 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 couldn't, they couldn't actually be approached uh, for, um, uh, beyond uh, the, the limit of the body, one's body. So these uh, enhance the uh, sensation of um, almost secretive um, of, a, of, of a particular life um, and way of representing it. And um, uh, the kind of reflection or extension of one image in others, and the, there's the very imp impressive use of photography. Uh, was uh, uh, you know a, a strong experience. I then, I then began to feel that uh, I wanted to compare uh, this notion of uh, an artistic practice um, that was as probably, how can I put this, with trying to um, make, was there any relationship between uh, the clearing away of, of clutter and elements um, in, uh, in contrast to 20th century's art process of ridding the space of all these details, all these uh, of sim symbols and figures uh, um, in order to reveal a space that was open and, and uh, full of possibility. I think that perhaps uh, there is a difference between a kind of biopsy of the self and, uh, and a preoccupation with the self um, as against an, an, an open structure that invites the participation and, 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 and the uh, identification with, with, with the concept. I then began to think about the exhibition as such and the difference between an exhibition which, a work which was, uh, 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 which was an ex a single work which was an exhibition and uh, was um, brought together and uh, in the uh, Malevich uh, corner painting that we saw, um, not only was there the work across a corner, but there were also works on the walls which were not aligned with the wall, which, were, which um, lent out from the wall um, and the whole, the whole, the whole notion of, of the hang of the exhibition became extremely significant. And in thinking again about uh, the nature of the exhibition, I was drawn to think about the uh, what might be the non-exhibition, exemplified by Eve Klein's uh, Void. V. David in the 1956, uh, 58. The void of the empty gallery. Uh, so the exhibition was the gallery itself, or was it uh, simply an emptied gallery? Um, and as I looked in, uh, drawn anyway to the notion of the void as a very important um, concept in in in, re in 20th century art. I read the account of the, of the showing of the, of, of the empty gallery of, incidentally, the gallery of Iris Clare, who was uh, one of the most innovative um, gallery people in Paris in that period. Um, that 
although it simply looked like an empty gallery, um, the, 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 the room was actually very carefully prepared. And I shall just read this note here saying, um, uh, one, one could start with the, the, the basic paradox, exhibition, no exhibition, which is exemplified by Yves Klein's Levide. The gallery was uh, emptied of ex exhibits. The empty gallery was exhibited. Uh, and in her book on Klein, uh, Sidra Stitch has described how the whiteness of the empty gallery was enhanced by several coats of a pure white lithopone pigment applied with a Ripplin enamel roller, blended with Klein's special varnish of alcohol, acetone, and, and vinyl resin. <laughs> so I actually see that simply emptying the gallery of objects was uh, um, uh, 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 challenged by uh, this very artificial uh, creation of the space. Uh, I'm, I'm going to end up as my, my time is up, but um, um, possibly during the discussion we could come back to, uh, uh, to, to, the, to, to, this, to these images which have suddenly reappeared um, and have some general um, uh, points of reference uh, to the specific work of, uh, of, um, of Anna. Thank you. I, I will happily start from the slides of Green and Common that, <laughs> that uh, Guy didn't show but did show. So uh, I think that's very nicely in keeping. Um, I uh, have had a very divided career. Uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, I was both taught by Terry Atkinson of Art and Language and then went my first job at the ICA. I, I arrived just as we were installing When Attitudes Become Form and this shaped me in my early years and I became particularly interested um, in what was taking place in Northern Europe. Um, Hanny Darboven I think is someone that I thought quite a lot of when I started to think about um, Anna Oppen. Uh, and Opperman. And um, she was the kind of one woman artist that I knew about and associated with conceptualism I in Northern Europe. So I always had a particular interest in her, but also a kind of distance from her because of an obsessive quality that was very much there in her work. Um, but uh, my students took me back um, in the 1990s to looking again at conceptualism and all my papers and my documents of conceptual art. Um, and I started working first of all with Catherine Mosley uh, and um, then on Unconcealed Book, realized that I was looking at a tiny little triangle in the top of Northern Europe, um, a triangle which I would suggest is between Cologne, Dusseldorf, um, Ghent, and uh, Brussels and Amsterdam, but I think it can go just as easily along, and this is what I started to think about with Anna Oppenheim, along to Hamburg and Kiel, and, uh, which is where she came from. I can find my notes. Uh, she, she came from Utin. Uh, Schleswig-Holstein by the Kiel Canal. And uh, I was very aware and very conscious that 
all the major exhibitions of major minimal and conceptual artists, all the dealer galleries and the small museums that made the pioneering shows came from this little triangle in the north of Europe. And I had to buried over the years a, a kind of love affair that I had um, with a German at, at that time, which I found very difficult to deal with. And you know, that's probably why I turned away from, from conceptual art over a period of 10, 15 years. And as I started to go back into it and began to kind of peel away uh, and uncover, I, I had a, a difficulty and a sense of shame of having a German lover over those years. My mother found it very difficult. Um, not with a German, are you? <laughs> um, I was born in 47. You know, so came out of just the, that end of, of the Second World War. And I can remember the first time I went to Cologne, getting off the train, having got on in Ostend and gone through to, to Cologne, you know, with the loudspeakers going, Achtung, Achtung. And, you know, the, the, this was really very difficult at that time. And I think that kind of sensitized me in a way uh, to what the Germans were themselves feeling. Uh, a lot of my friends were born either in 39 or 40, 41, this kind of period. And they'd been small children at the end of the Second World War. And I knew about the kind of street fighting and the bombing in that little triangle in Northern Europe which became this reception center um, uh, for British and American artists of that minimal and conceptual generation. And I also had a kind of political background. And I was very uncertain as to what had been the politics of that period. I had felt the kind of politics. Uh, and certainly, um, looking at the interview which Conrad Fisher did in Studio International at this time. He's talking about um, bringing the American artists over to Dusseldorf and um, helping them to make their work. It's not like when Warhol and Liechtenstein came where everything would have arrived in crates. And he was actually bringing the artists over and helping them to make their work there in Dusseldorf. I've recently been digging into Carl Andre's flat metal pieces, the steel pieces on the floor, which more than the bricks are the classic Andre pieces. And uh, when you look at the original invitation card for the Conrad Fischer show in Dusseldorf, um, it's, it's not a postcard, it's like a double postcard. And he had this gallery, which was quite special. He rented an alleyway between two buildings and had doors made for either end of that alleyway. Uh, and so it was long and thin, you know, like a bicycle alleyway. And this is where all the artists like Carl Andre, Solowit, Donald Judd, all had their first exhibitions in Europe from 1967 onwards. And the back of this Carl Andre postcard had a little biography of Carl, which wasn't very long in those days, you know, five or six items. And in the midst of it, it said 1966 Jewish Museum. It didn't say Kiniston McShine's serial formations at the Jewish Museum. It just said Jewish Museum. And I kind of wondered, was it Conrad who put that there, or was it Carl Andre who put that there? And then on the other side of, of the invitation card were the details of that first exhibition, and it was called um, um, I can't remember. I find it in a minute. Uh, something like serial formation. It wasn't serial formation, but ontologies. Plastique was the title of it. 
And then underneath that, it had this German name of a manufacturing company who had made the piece. And this was the first time that Karl had actually had metal pieces made for him. You know, he'd used bricks, he'd used scrap metal, but he'd never had a piece actually made. And um, he, he confirmed for me a, a rumor that I'd heard that Conrad's father was a quite high official in Mannesmann, the German steel manufacturer, and Dusseldorf is the steel city of, of Germany. So there were all these kind of little uncomfortablenesses, and that's just examples that one was feeling all the time in Germany at that time. And looking at um, a satellite map, again, you can see how bright that little triangle is at the, in northern Europe. It's, it really is the center of, of manufacture. And so these issues that I'm kind of pulling out from this first exhibition that Karl held in Germany. And I started to think about Karl and Germany in the context of him never having put in any of his CVs of this period anything to do with Vietnam. I knew that uh, and his own service uh, as a U.S. soldier, I think in 63, 64, 65, that kind of period, Carl was uh, called up because in those days, both Britain and the U.S. had a people's army. It had a, an army uh, of conscription. And Carl had been, I think, very affected. He says all the time, it was about being in the railroad that gave him this sort of sense of the metal. Uh, but I, I think it was being in the intelligence corps of the U.S. Air Force that had also given him this kind of sense of metal and stacking and organization. Um, and one sees so closely this sense of steel, of manufacture, of in industrial areas like this area in the north of, of Germany, as well as in, in the north of Britain and its closeness to military and military formations. This is um, the list of artists that Conrad Fischer did. Um, he prepared this list for Studio International in 1971 showing um, the first European one-man shows, the first one-man shows anywhere, uh, the first German one-man shows, and the way in which he put together in this tiny little space in Dusseldorf, this is the, the alleyway um, where all these exhibitions took place, and he was himself just a, a young artist. But the kind of importance of bringing these artists back into Germany at that point in 1969. And I couldn't resist that. That's Boyce at the opening of this first exhibition of Carl Andre um, anywhere in Europe in 1969, standing quite happily on, on the metal squares. And this is this little invitation card. And that's how it opens up to show the space. And there you have the Jewish Museum, New York, in the center of that card. And then this uh, ontologies plastique. Another kind of symptom of this period and the kind of chaos that one was feeling in this period uh, was the economic instability. And this is the decade, I go into this much more in the book Unconcealed, about the networks of um, galleries and, and museums and collectors at this moment in time. But you can see the 
Deutsche Mark and the dollar, uh, where at the start of the decade in 67, you got four Deutsche Marks to the dollar, and then it becomes 1.83. Uh, uh, for a dollar, you only got 1.83. It's halved over the period of that decade. And similarly, you can see with the pound to the Deutsche Mark. Um, when I was first going to Germany in the late 60s, I was getting 11 Deutsche Marks to the pound. Uh, but by the end of the decade, it was under four Deutsche Marks to, to the pound. And so another big factor in the kind of rise of this period in, in contemporary art. Back again to Hanny Darboven. And when I received, I didn't see the exhibition until I came here uh, this weekend, but I was already thinking that a lot of this. And it was really because of this invitation card. And the image that I had of this invitation card um, was to do with my own childhood. I uh, was Scottish, but I grew up in Dover. And the number of bombed buildings in Dover that I grew up amongst, where you had the wallpaper, uh, the staircase, and the kind of evidence of people living. And I felt very strongly that the kind of imagery here uh, was a, 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 a response from Anna Oppenheim, Opperman about um, the desolation that she had seen as a child. And Conrad Fisher in this interview in Studio International talking about bringing over uh, the American and British artists to, to Dusseldorf at that moment in time is saying that he would um, um, bringing the artists together, people like Gerhard Richter and uh, uh, Sigmar Polka with the American artists in the bar meant that when, Carl, when they went to New York for the first time, they already knew Carl Andre and Solowit. And he said it was very important to get over their inferiority complex in that way. And I think this has to be something of the background to Anna's work and to the forms that we see. Thank you. Okay, thank you to all four of our panellists for some very thought-provoking presentations. Um, from Martin and Toby, some very interesting remarks about the um, avant-garde nature of Opperman's work in that it, it foresaw almost intuitively the kind of complex technological networks that we're living in today. And, um, and then some very interesting historical resonances and comparisons from Guy and Linda. I'd like to ask the panel, uh, if they would like to pick up on any of the synergies between the different presentations, if there's anything that they um, would like to ask one another initially before opening it to the floor. Can I just, um, I'm just to avoid any confusion, um, just very briefly say um, what images I was about to show, which I couldn't find, and then I found, and, and then and I found, I find, I find them. I was um, just developing um, uh, on a experience I'd had looking at the work here, um, in that it's, it seemed, it, it, it reminded me of, of a shrine. And that was partly because there was a, a light in, in, the, in the center of it. And then I thought about all the occasions when people bring something, some ob object, a flower, or it is to mark uh, very strong feelings that they have. Um, and this was perhaps a parallel expression to hers when um, uh, thousands of uh, people descended on the Greenham Common miss US missile base 
in the south of England over one weekend to protest against nuclear weapons. Um, and people were just asked to bring anything with them that signified life. So you had a huge collage covering more than one mile of this, the uh, perimeter fence of, uh, of, Green of Greenham Common. And we had a curious, interesting resemblance to her work because she, hers was the work of, a, of, a, of an individual. Uh, whereas the Greenham Common was a, a collective expression of um, anyone who wanted to contribute. And um, so that's all I wanted to say. I think that, that picks up quite nicely said some of the images that um, Toby was showing, the Hirshhorn image, doesn't it, in a sense, that um, altar or shrine. It's quite an interesting difference to the archive in terms of the relationship that it sets up with the viewer. I wonder if you'd like to say anything more about that, Toby? Um, I, well, I think the idea of obsessiveness that also came up in one of your presentations um, perhaps relates to that a little bit, no? Um, and the obsessiveness of churning out images and creating relationships between those images, though trying to somehow develop a context for it. So base it around a plant, or base it around a philosopher, like mm -hmm. in, the, in, in the context of Hirschhorn, no? Um, so, you know, there is a lot of material that goes into these altars or ensembles, and there is a lot of uh, obsessiveness uh, somehow within the collection process, but nevertheless there is a sort of contextual framework that then, you know, presents the work. And, uh, and in Sao Paulo we had a lot of artists that were working in that fashion, so um, not only was she presented next to Fiyu's work, um, and Lisa could have talked a little bit about this, but um, um, but also like uh, um, other artists like um, Hans Eichelbohm or um, Horst Ademeit, who were very much uh, presenting their work in this sort of opulent uh, presentation manner. And um, yeah, I think that's something that I mean that that we were interested in certainly when we were working on uh, the imminence of poetics, which was the title of that biennial. That we were looking at these sort of artist figures who were pr producing text-based works um, that had a certain analogy to images, but always in a very sort of um, recluded or secluded um, um, manner of production and that then comes out as something totally overwhelming, also present in Bispo de Rosario's work, which we have been showing there. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I also thought um, that the presentation of Martin was, um, um, yeah, was very intriguing for me because, um, you know, we've been thinking a lot about the idea of constellation and, um, and it, in the Warburgian maps, and um, and I'd like Martin maybe to say a little bit more about this because he's so close to Hamburg and Warburg, and um, and maybe you could bring a little bit out your um, thoughts and into how that relates maybe to the thinking of Warburg or what your software could do for Warburg nowadays. And, um, yeah, that the, the, the parallel is that uh, the Warburg uh, Atlas was a strictly visual one. It was heavily based on the knowledge of texts, but this arrangement was a strictly visual one. Not, uh, not relying on similarity, but say on topic. Uh, this is something which I think is very important. That, and that this, this is also the reason why computers could not do that themselves. The best they could do is uh, picking out very, very similar images and then they fail uh, catastrophically in finding out that something is related visually. Uh, in, in, in that sense, Warburg was one of was a really very avant-garde to, to putting uh, the material uh, in, a, in, a, in a spatial manner. Uh, and this is also what, what Anna does despite of the fact that the internal structure is very, very ordered, even hierarchical, it is, say, spread out in space. It is something very different. Uh, if you if you would do that uh, according uh, to, to the to these uh, filaments that you showed uh, in your slides, um, it, it would look very much the same. It would be a spider's web, so to speak, or not that, not as ordered as a spider's web, because you have, say, uh, 
spatial relationships hopping from from point to point. If you would really do it like Warburg did it with a wooden wooden thread, it would look very chaotic, a bit like like the slide of the image you showed. You you you, man, you you must be thinking of the Marcel Duchamp. Yes, yeah. yes, of the Marcel it Duchamp. Yes, it, it had the effect, I think, of actually linking up one work in the exhibition with another in a sort of cross, con constant cross-reference to existing works. And it, I think it was his, uh, what he thought he could contribute to the exhibition was this web that linked uh, all, all the pieces together in 16 miles of string. Yes, I would very much like to know how this fields or how, that, how it works to put up an Oppermann ensemble and to have these spatial relationships that build up all this visual complexity. Uh, maybe if, uh, Herbert could tell us something about that this later on or... This might actually be a good time to open things up because time has ticked on so we have, we have slightly less time than we planned for audience questions but it would be wonderful um, if we could do that for the next 10 minutes or so. So does Eve, do you want to start? Um, I, I guess this what, this, uh, in, what, what intrigues me about this exhibition is the fact that I've been wondering for some time why we haven't moved towards the art critical um, equivalent of, of an analysis of quantum mechanics and that we remain resolutely with Newtonian physics and look towards the object as a, an essential component. What strikes me about this work is that we are talking about copying and copying and copying and duplicating and repro reproducing. We're talking about relations between things. We're talking about the equivalent of waves, perhaps rather than objects. And in that sense, we're talking about something which is distinctively different in its physical characteristics. And yet, I'm afraid, art history, art criticism sticks resolutely with the, with the 18th and 17th century, and it hasn't yet caught up with how we might usefully interpret this work in terms of our present predicaments. A theoretical physicist might be able to talk about this and see what I'm talking about. Thank you. Uh, I think your impression that the vocabulary of art history is not fit to describe this. I think this, this, this impression is correct. And I think we should try to, we, we should try other concepts which are more related to now very popular media like the internet to describe what's happening there. And uh, my insight is that there are very good reasons to do that. Uh, but maybe this is a biological problem. The young art historians will, will be able to do that, maybe. No? They are not? OK. So then, then, they, then they should take courses from other faculties to be able to. Do we have any other questions in this community? <laughs> Thanks. It's more of a footnote or a short remark to this parallels that have been drawn between the way of working of Anna Oppermann and the internet and network technologies, which I appreciate very much, but I think there's one thing we should not forget, or which I would, would like to add. The notion of the open work has been mentioned, which, which is the internet. And I think the, the most important feature of that open work is collaboration. It means there's something there and people take something and add something and make it bigger and expand it. And this does not, certainly not at all fit with that work. The limits of this work is really the physical entity of the artist. In that sense, we have an individual authorship. With the death of the author, the open artwork comes to an end. And I think that's really important because that's where the limits also to this, with this parallel of the internet lie, because it is very much um, a, a, an individual universe which is expressed through very complex networks. But I think um, kind of this metaphor, if you want to say, of the internet does not really match. Also, it's a physical object. It's a unique physical object, this ensemble exists only once and is a material object. It's, it's uh, hard and expensive when it has to travel to set up and all that. That's all different with the internet. It's not immaterial. So the materiality, the uniqueness, the individual authorship, I think, are very important characteristics of the work. I just wanted to add this. Thank you. 
But on, on that note, I, I would like to say a few words. Um, actually, me and uh, um, Lisa probably discussed about this in terms of, is it, uh, I, I completely agree with what uh, um, Cornelia just mentioned with the death of author and then that's the end of the work, but then what only you could present in an exhibition situation, that's what me and Lisa talked about, would be only the materiality of this work. But I think it exactly with that uh, um, fact bearing in mind and what we, we wanted to achieve in this exhibition, I don't know if we've been successful or felt, which was an uh, emphasis on this word, practice, rather than the piece of work. So what attracted me to Anna Oppmann's practice is the practice, which I could refer to the title of this roundtable discussion, the process of content. So it's not the work. Of course, you know, me and Elisa probably discussed about this a little bit. When Anna Oppmann's work's been staged in an exhibition, you can only see it as an object. And I'm, I'm trying very hard to find a way not to foreground this body of objects, but to foreground the practice of thinking in on an anonymous practice through this sort of discursive discussion events and through writers' responses through all these conversations we had here. I could contribute an anecdote on the, on the stuff Cornelia Solfang just brought up because Anna had the idea that actually one should put a computer into her ensembles that the public could rearrange because she did not want at all that others rearranged her ensembles but to do it say virtually on a computer that was okay for her so this was say one vision that never has been realized as far as I know, but that was her idea that that could be done without, uh, say, destroying her ensemble on computers for everybody. Yes. So the, the death of the author is, as Bart said, the birth of the reader, I guess, or the birth of the viewer in that sense there. Um, we have time maybe for one, one more question, if there is one. Yes, Catherine? I just had a question for um, Toby. I think you were talking about, at one point, about a sort of personality-based um, generation of meaning, and you listed a number of characteristics, and one of them was intellectualism, which I thought was really interesting in relation to an idea of a practice of thinking. Um, and I wondered whether you might be able to say something more about what, what that term intellectualism means to you in relation to contemporary art now. Well, um, I think what you, um, what, you've, what, I, what I was referring to when I was talking about this was this idea of the production of a personality um, um, in, on social media, but also in socializing, yeah, um, which um, creates a sort of um, a brand for an artist, which then, you know, is transferred from this rather liquid sort of atmosphere of um, being together um, or talking to each other, either physically um, or um, on on the web, and then translates, um, you know, that sort of. A discursive activity, whether that is actually spoken word or just like the confrontation with text and images on Instagram or Facebook, um, how that then translates into um, uh, into production in a gallery system or in a museum system. Yeah, and um, so this is sort of one aspect that I'm interested in. Another, uh, there are lots of other aspects which I think uh, refers also to this idea of physicality. Of course, is I mean, how does um, uh, this uh, digital? How do these digital frameworks influence um, the production of sculpture, for example, or photographs in an aesthetic way? So, how do we transfer aesthetics from the internet communication into um, into actual artwork production? But um, yeah, I think that there is a lot of talk about this right now, and um, I don't know if it answers your question. Intellectualism, I don't know. Um, uh, how I could 
refer, or maybe I should have said discourse or something, yeah, uh, rather than intellectualism, but um, maybe the propping up of um, artistic productions through discourse, no, and through thinking or plugging um, references from one thing to another. I think also when looking at this, you know, this idea of analogy is interesting, no? That um, you, you create analogies between things that initially have nothing to do with each other, like in Warburg, yeah? Um, and I think this is also interesting in, um, in curating at the moment, no? Or not only in the moment, but um, like how you could, per, for example, um, yeah, um, Put uh, put a put an architectural model next to a painting, next to a screen print of um, of an Instagram uh, profile. No, and um, um, Richard Prince's show recently in New York was sort of the epitomization of that. No way he was painting Instagram portraits. Yeah, um, but um, and also I mean, or 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 or, or the Reina Sofia does it very well in their exhibitions where they kind of are able to create these sort of analogies from their own collection, yeah. um, pulling things from different contexts and bringing those together. Other questions? Okay, well I said at the outset that I was going to be strict with time and I am going to be strict with time, I'm afraid. So um, on behalf of Sophia and myself and the team at the Cooper Gallery, I'd like to um, thank all of our panelists and I, I would like to ask you to join me to do so. Thank you very much. Thank you.